Welcome everybody to our bite-sized genomic session about Leap Syndrome. Um, we've got some great speakers this afternoon. So um, we have Leanne, who's living with Lynch Syndrome. We've got Vicky Kiesel, who's a senior genetic counsellor and our Lynch Syndrome lead for the East Midlands. And we've got Kirsty Williams, who's a gynae oncology CNS at Nottingham University Hospitals. Um, so. so we're going to have um, 10 minutes for questions and answers at the end. But if you've got any questions, type them in the chat um, or send them afterwards and can get back to you. And I thought it would be quite brilliant to start off with the, I think, the most important perspective in Lynch syndrome is a person who's living with Lynch syndrome. So Leanne has very kindly agreed to speak to us about her experience. So Leanne is a mum and she works for Next as a brand marketing manager and she's amazing. So Leanne, can I hand over to you? Is that okay? Sure you can. So it was a very generous introduction. Thank you. <laughs> just normal me, but nice to meet you all. Sorry. Um, I will just give you a bit of a backstory about myself and sort of how I came into discovering I had Lynch syndrome and then what that's meant to me, if that's all right. But if anyone's got any questions or anything at any point, feel free to dive in and uh, I'll do my best to answer as well. So, um, as I mentioned, I my day job, I work here at Next. Uh, I work on nice brand marketing imagery. So what you guys do is way above where I am and I'm admirable of all of you. So uh, thank you. Um, so just bring up speed. So it was around so it was springtime 2009, my dad developed bowel cancer. I mean, it was quite poorly at the time. It was quite far along when they caught it. Um, he had bowel perforated and he was in intensive care for quite a long time. And luckily, um, he recovered from that. It was a long recovery, but he did recover gratefully. So um, we, at the time, we were questioning sort of, my his dad my granddad also had bowel cancer and my dad had previously had bladder cancer and he was still early 50s at this point as well so if we kind of questioned it and if there was a hereditary link there um, and we had quite a good relationship with his consultant who became his consultant at the time so we asked him the question like is it a possibility it could be linked and he had heard of Lynch syndrome so he said there is a possibility I can look into it for you and um, then began the testing for us, um, in which point we were referred to uh, Julian Barwell and the genetics team at Leicester Royal Infirmary. Um, and we, we started the process, so we had counselling to kind of talk about the options and the outcomes, because at this time I was sort of 22, not really thinking about the future and health and life as such, I'd not long graduated and it was all fine. Um, and we went through a counselling process to kind of establish how we'd feel if we were positive, if we did find uh, that we were carrying this gene. Um, and I think, they, no, sorry, they tested my dad's tumour at the time, I think, that revealed that he he was a Lynch syndrome carrier himself and that we could have the chance, sorry, of having that. So it was 50-50 between myself and my sister. Um, she, at the time, had a little girl, so hopefully we were hoping that she hadn't got it on so there's a chance that she there was no chance she'd have passed it on to her daughter already as well um and then we went we went through the testing and it transpired that i had the gene and my sister didn't which was fine at the time and it means that i remember julian and his team at the time were very understand it and made put, put me at ease straight away basically and it was uh, they gave me such an understanding of what this meant and the screening process going forward um, and also that my <laughs> reassurance that having seen my dad in such a, a bad position with it, it gave me that reassurance that I wouldn't necessarily be in that position myself <laughs> with a dad in a Again, Julia's been a constant support. I've had the 
I've been lucky enough to have him sort of looking after my case as well and making sure that I'm on top of all my screenings and we'll review it sort of every couple of years just to make sure nothing's slipping through the net as well in terms of just keeping on track for me and monitoring me, which is great. Um, the screening program itself, um, I go through regular ultrasounds, colonoscopies, um, just to make sure that everything's good. And also the family testing element has been great for us as well, because I've got members of my dad's side of the family that I've been able to make aware that there's a possibility that, that they could have this as well. And it's been their decision whether they wanted to um, go through testing themselves as well. Some people have, some people haven't, but I'd sooner be on with the knowledge and make that decision myself than not have any idea whatsoever. And again, then look where my dad could possibly have been as well. Um, and also the, the great thing about Lynch syndrome awareness for me is that I've been, able, I've been fortunate to be able to go through genetic PGD IVF with my son. So myself being a carrier means that I'm 50% I've got a 50% chance of carrying that, uh, passing that on to children as well. So um, I spoke to Julian at one of our checkups and when I was at a point I've met my partner, we were ready to discuss children. I've always been very honest and open about it as well because I think there's no shame to anything like this. Um, and we decided to move down the PGD route um, and we got referred down to guys in London. I'm based up here in the middle of Leicester, so we got referred down to Guy's Hospital in London, underwent the IVF process, um, managed to check that the embryo that we were putting in didn't have the gene mutation and therefore wouldn't have Lynch syndrome. Um, we started that process back in 2015 and then in October 2017 I had my little boy Jasper who's now five uh, and runs rings around me but we've always sort of been very grateful and just know how we feel it's a, it's a special boy anyway, but even more so because we, we know that we've gone through this process. And for me to have had that option of uh, going down that uh, route and making that decision and knowing that he won't be affected by this hopefully in the future has been something that I'm just so grateful for. And I think it's definitely been the right decision for us, not necessarily for everybody, but it's, yeah, we're really happy with the choice that we made in that one. Um, we did try for a second embryo and unfortunately that one didn't work. That was back in 2020 with lockdown. Um, but around that time as well, I got some results back from a regular um, ultrasound that showed there were some irregularities uh, with my womb um, and my ovaries as well. So I've just gone down a surgery route in February this year uh, to have a full hysterectomy as well to eliminate the risks that were associated that side for me for uh, with having Lynch syndrome so it eliminates a lot of that obviously there is still colonoscopies and regular screening that I need on the other side of things as well but again just the mental load of knowing what could happen if that developed further and got worse and obviously having my son now I feel like again just information for me has armed me with the knowledge and I've been able to make the decisions that I feel are right for me and my family through knowing about Lynch syndrome which has been great um, and I think also as well just the awareness of Lynch syndrome in the sort of what 10 12 years since I found out about it and my experience with dealing with medical staff, awareness has definitely grown over that time, but there's still so little known about it, not known about it, so little awareness about it in just my touch points that I've had uh, with hospitals, but also just in society as well. And I just think that's something definitely that's quite exciting, not exciting, but is necessarily to be built on for awareness for everyone to be able to be in the fortunate position I am if you have got this to be aware of it and make your decisions based upon that which I think is really important um another thing as well is just that through me talking about it just to friends and family there's actually a lady that I work with who's an art director down in London and her sister had she had a family history and through talking to me she was became aware and she got tested after her sister had um, cancer, well her sister got tested, sorry, to see about Lynch syndrome and it was discovered that her family are carriers of it as well and now her daughters are looking at going down the IVF route to eliminate it as well. So it's only through talking to people 
that that got picked up as well in the awareness so um I think yeah there's a lot of positives around it but there's a lot more positives to come from it too and there's a lot of work to be done but I know Julian and certain teams have been looking at the app development and just tools that can help me and people in my situation to self-monitor and keep on top of those regular screenings so that we're never in that position where it's too little too late almost and I think that's the most important thing for me just to be very fortunate to be cared for and be monitored it's yeah it makes me feel in a much better position so that's me in a nutshell sorry I've walked on for a little while but um has anyone got any questions or is anyone wow that's great Leanne and I'm so I was so excited to hear you present I forgot to introduce myself so I'll just say I'm Annette Breen one of the lead nurses for the East Genomic Medical Services Alliance. So sorry, I forgot in the excitement. So has anybody got any quick questions for Leanne? Because um, I mean, I suppose you've given a lot of information there. And I think one of the things you said, Leanne, it sounds it's like quite by chance that you found out about Lynch syndrome. Because um, at that time, it was very, it was because the consultant was interested exactly. rather, I think rather it's changed since hasn't it but at that time I was lucky I think to be captured and then also because you were at Leicester the consultant was interested and he probably had pretty close links with Julian and the clinical genetics team which was why you're able to take things forward um, so we're getting lots of brilliant comments about how courageous you are and um, how important your story. Um, so <laughs> Laura from um, Cambridge Hospitals has asked, is genetic testing for Lynch syndrome free? And yes, it is. It's available on the NHS, but obviously you have to um, be sort of seen by a healthcare team to have to be able to access it. And um, so somebody's asked, Leanne, could you please say what was found in the gynae related department? I had um, fibroids, I had an irregular womb lining thickening, and oh, there was something else as well. And it was just flags that, given that I had Lynch, um my consultant wasn't kind of comfortable with what that could develop into i think in the the statistics that go with it so there was something else as well but yeah it was the fibroids the re irregular thickening and i i've always had really heavy periods as well and it's just the signs i think that are associated with that okay so no more than me probably <laughs> okay and um Somebody, oh, and somebody had their hand up. I um, can't remember who it was. Was it Joanne? Uh, never mind. So anyway, got a question. Yeah, it part? was me. Sorry, it was me. Yeah, yeah I, I missed the first bit. It broke up. Can, can you just let me know? Sorry, how how did this all start with you? How did you go down this route? And I'm um, sorry if you've been over that once already. No, that's fine. No, that's fine. Um, so I worked, my dad developed bowel cancer around 2009 um, and he had previously had bladder cancer. He was in his early 50s and his dad, so my granddad, had also, he'd passed Hi. away from bowel cancer. So um, it was me and my sister at the time who asked about a possible genetic or hereditary link there and it was his consultant who had the links with Julian, we think, that um, started process for us. Oh, OK, thank you. So so if this, if this was the case and you were one of those patients like you, how would you approach that yourself? Is it are you reliant on consultants that having the knowledge of things or? Um, I think I was at that time, but I think now there is more of a process where if it is there is a family link with cancer. The ch correct me if I'm wrong, guys, as well, and that you probably know, but there's the link with testing the tumours now, isn't there? And the awareness. Yeah. Well, was, I don't, don't think that was in place back then. Ah, okay, thank you. Thank you. And so um, somebody's asking, what sort of surveillance you currently have, Leanne? 
Um, so I currently have, well, I was having ultrasounds. Um, I don't think they'll continue now, but um, I have screening of colonoscopies every 18 months to two years. Yeah. Um, and then I have the checkups with Julian as well every sort of two years, just so that if there are any developments or new tests that I'm not automatically linked into, it's a review to see if that's going to benefit me. But I think ultrasounds are every sort of 12 to 18 months, internal and external scans as well on that. Um, but that's it at the moment in terms of screening. Yeah, I've just got a question about your PGG. So I think I can answer this. So the question is, was your IV fully funded? So pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is available through the NHS for people who have got a particular genetic conditions, but it's they're only available via the clinical genetic service. You can't, you can't just say, I want pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So that important thing on that was just for me and my life choices was that was sort of discussed from the start and it was very when you're ready we're here to discuss it with you and we can talk through your options and that's very how I felt with everything sort of as I've gone through it's sort of it's on my terms but it's there when I need the help and that's been really supportive for me as well so oh that's brilliant I'll just see if there's any quick ones um can I ask if there was anything that was said or wasn't said from your healthcare professionals that helped you when you first find out and found out about it? Um, just knowing what was in store for me, obviously they were so supportive and talked through all the options. It was counselling in terms of um, depending on the different outcomes, how we'd feel and how we deal with it as well. And if we did struggle with it, they could help. They would, they would look into help. I don't know what it would have been, but. I just felt so informed, but not overwhelmed as well. And I think being the people that they are that I dealt with, they were very human people still as well, rather than overwhelming me with medical knowledge and information. It was it was done in such a lovely way that benefited me and made sense to me at the time and helped me make those decisions that um Sorry, I've waffled. What was the question? No, 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 no. It really, it really sounds that what was helpful is that the team that you saw at the time, they explained it in terms of the context of your life rather than exactly. sort of just reading out of a textbook or out of a patient yeah. information leaflet. Or here's a leaflet, off you go. It's very yeah. humane way. And also, I think having dealt with Julian for the last 12 years or so, having that one person to go I'm here and I'm going to help you and that's been worth so much to me that if I have a problem I can speak to him and having that person on hand almost not that I've, I've been in touch with them all the time but to have that continuity I think of knowing who to turn to if I have got concerns is a huge reassurance for me as well. Oh that's great so Thank you very much, Leanne. And I'm going to have to, I've got loads and loads of questions, but it's very good. It stimulated a lot of thought. Um, so quite a few of the questions have been about a link syndrome support group. Yes, there is one, Link Syndrome UK, I think they're called. And also quite a few of the questions have been about how to access testing, who is eligible for testing, which is brilliant because that streamlines streamlined very nicely into Vicky's presentation. So I'm going to introduce the wonderful Vicky Kiesel, Senior Genetic Counselor from UHL and also our Lynch Syndrome Lead for the East Midlands. And she's going to talk a little bit about Lynch Syndrome um, perhaps a little bit about how difficult it's been to access testing and what we're doing to make it more accessible. Would that be a fair summary, Vicky? It is, yes. Thank you very much, Annette. So I'm going to try and sh share my slides, which is always the most difficult part of any presentation. Um, I have got slides, but please just stop me if you have questions as I go along. OK, can you all see that? Excellent. OK, um, so. Just to give you a bit of background on Lynch syndrome, an estimated 175,000 people in the UK have the condition, and it's the most common cause of inherited colorectal and endometrial cancer. 
So it causes, causes around 1,100 colorectal cancers a year in the UK. And it's responsible for 3% of all endometrial and colorectal cancer. So I will talk a little bit more about the test that's done on the tumor. But typically, Lynch syndrome associated cancers show the absence of some of um, four proteins, but I'll explain more about that. Um, and there are tests that are now done on all tumors to screen for Lynch syndrome. The main tumors, of course, as we've talked about, are endometrial and colorectal cancer, but Lynch syndrome in some situations can also cause gastric um, and other types of cancer as well. So Lynch syndrome, for anybody who doesn't know, is a dominant condition. Uh, just to remind anyone who doesn't remember back from their science classes or their medical degrees or nursing degrees, um, we obviously have two copies of every gene. Um, you get one from your mother, one from your father. If somebody has Lynch syndrome, they will have a normal gene copy and a mutated copy. So every time they have a child, there's a 50-50 chance that that child will inherit it. Um, there's no gender effect, which means that you get half of your genes whether from each parent, regardless of whether they're male or female. Um, and it, that means that it's also really important to look at both sides of the family. Um, Lynch syndrome is associated with various different cancers, and there are four or well, five main genes that cause Lynch syndrome. We still refer to it as one condition, um, but the more we learn about it, the more we realise actually it's different conditions because people with different genes have different cancer associated risks. So in general, we say the risk of colorectal cancer is up to 57% um, and the risk of endometrial. Oh, is it not moving on? OK, why is it not moving on? Someone's just put in the chat that it's not moving on. Which... OK, it's not right. Um, why is it not showing it? It's moving on for me, Victoria. Oh, OK. Yeah, and me. OK, well, I'm going to hope that it is moving on then. Um, so in terms of cancers, yeah, the risk of endometrial cancer is up to 49%. Gastric cancer is around 13%. But the really important thing that we're learning now is that, as I said, different genes have different cancer risks. So we know that MLH1 has a risk of 57% for colorectal cancer in men, which is significantly higher than the risk for PMS2. Um, we also know that the risk of upper GI cancer is highest in men who carry a mutation in MLH1. Um, with MSH2, it also causes a significant risk of both um, endometrial and ovarian cancer in women. And in men, there's quite a significant risk of prostate cancer. While looking at the other two genes, MSH6 and PMS2, the risks are typically quite a bit lower. Um, so colorectal cancer with PMS2 is around 13% and PMS2 is not associated with ovarian cancer. So you can see somebody with a 13% risk of colorectal cancer and a PMS2 mutation has quite different risks compared to a man with an MLH1 mutation. Um, but at the moment, we still call it all the same condition. People are moving towards breaking it down by gene. If somebody has Lynch syndrome and they have a cancer, then we do target the treatment on that basis. So somebody with colorectal cancer may have more extensive surgery. Rather than just removing the cancer, they may remove the whole colon because that also prevents risks in the future. Um, while if somebody has either colorectal or endometrial cancer, they consider immunotherapy. So we know that immunotherapy is particularly effective in people with Lynch syndrome, and that's one of the newer medications that is now available. Making sure this is all moving on. So if somebody is unaffected, so this screening applies to all carriers, they should have colonoscopies every two years, as Leanne said. Um, it depends on which gene the person has as to what age they start colonoscopies. MLH1 and MSH2 start at 25. MSH6 and PMS2 start at 30, 35. So 25 for MLH1, 35 for MSH6. One of the other things that's available is chemo prevention with aspirin. We know that just taking aspirin lowers the risk of any associated cancer by about 50%. So this is something that we discuss with anybody who carries Lynch syndrome. We, I can, think I can see Leanne nodding, so yeah, good. Um, we also test people for a bacteria called H. pylori. 
Uh, it's very common, a lot of people have H. pylori and it can be treated by antibiotics, um, but we know that people who have untreated H. pylori um, have an increased risk of gastric cancer. So simply detecting and treating that lowers the risk by 50%. So those two things are actually quite simple to do, but can make a big difference. Um, I can see someone in the chat has said, what dose of aspirin? It's a very good question. We're not entirely certain. They're still doing a trial called CAP3, randomising people to different dosage um, to work out exactly what the dose should be. But at the moment, our guidance is if somebody weighs under 70 kilograms, it's 150 and over 70 kilograms, it should be 300. That's, to be honest, our best estimate, um, but we are hoping research will help narrow that down in future. We also suggest that women consider having a hysterectomy and possible oophorectomy um, once they're over the age of 40. That is a very difficult decision um, and it's very much tailored on the person. So we would refer them to gynaecology potentially to discuss it. Um, but again, it would be very much tailored to what, where that woman was in her life, um, how difficult colonoscopies could be, how she felt about potentially going through menopause at 40, all of those different things. And of course, her experience of womb and or ovarian cancer in the family. Um, so it, there'd be a lot of support for that. I can also see in the chat, someone said, how long are you on aspirin for? And that's essentially indefinitely. So we would suggest that people who have Lynch syndrome take it daily indefinitely. Obviously, I should have said the caveats, if people have stomach ulcers or bleeding, then they shouldn't take it, which is why we always tell people to speak to their GP before taking aspirin. Should, have, should definitely make that clear. Um, and in terms of how long the two yearly colonoscopies continue to, we say up till about 70, but some people may continue past that if they're particularly fit and healthy. Um, in terms of for men, we know that there is a risk of prostate cancer. Um, we know that that particularly starts around the age of 40 and there is a study called IMPACT, which men are able to be enrolled in, or we can just ask them to have PSA testing with their GP, so long as they're aware that it's not straightforward. Um, and by that I mean PSA is not the best test. It can be high for non-cancerous reasons and it can be low when people have cancer, but it is still the best screening test we have for prostate cancer at the moment. Oh, Vicky, I think Caroline's got a question. Caroline, please. Sorry, I, I did. I was just going to try and reply in the chat, really. Um, there was the question about until they become eligible to join the bowel cancer screening programme. I was just going to say that the Lynch syndrome patients are about to be managed by the bowel cancer screening programme later this year. So it will be they will be continuing to do the two yearly colonoscopies. They won't be doing the fit test um, unless they opt to go through their original screening um, programmes, but uh, sorry, their surveillance programme, but uh, they will be being managed by the screening programme from about June, probably this year. Oh, that's good news. So that, it's supposed to be April. <laughs> well, yes, and, and then it was supposed to be May, but it, it should be fairly soon. The numbers are coming through. Um, but yeah, I was just just really going to say that it's not going to stop. They will continue with that two years up until they're 74 at the moment, because that's the bowel cancer screening cut off. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. No, no, thank you. It was helpful. Um, and the last thing to mention for all limb syndrome carriers is, as Leanne's told us, about the option of PGD, so pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Um, again, as Leanne said, it's very personal. Some people are very much um, very sure that this is the right route for them. Other people don't want to consider it. And there are some people, although it's rare, that consider testing in pregnancy. And um, that's a very controversial and difficult decision to make because if someone has testing in pregnancy, the only option is to consider whether to continue it. So that's quite rare that people consider that. PGD is more common um, and PGD is funded on the NHS for non-smokers, women with a normal BMI um, and for the first cycle, first, sorry, three cycles or one healthy child um, with the caveat that they do freeze embryos that you can attempt to use later. Um, the reason that's important is because it does mean that people are not funded to have more than one child typically. Um, Okay. Oh, that's great. Could you talk a little bit more about um, testing, how people access it, and a little bit about mainstreaming, Vicky? 
I can absolutely. So in terms yeah. of how we identify people that are at risk of Lynch syndrome, we know that although one in 350 people have Lynch syndrome, 95% currently are undiagnosed. Um, and one of the NHS's major goals is that 75% of all cancers should be diagnosed at early stages, which very much, fit, very much fits into the directive of how to screen for Lynch syndrome. So we universally test all, all tumours. Every endometrial and every colorectal cancer is screened for Lynch syndrome. And that's done preferably on the biopsy. Um, if, if that's not available, they do it on the resection. Um, so the way that they do that screen is they look at four proteins for the MLH1, MSH2, MSH6 and PMS2. There are various patterns that are then produced and based on the patterns in the tumour, we know whether it's more or less likely that someone has Lynch syndrome. If it's PMMR, which stands for proficient mismatch repair, then we know that it's pretty much normal. We don't worry about Lynch syndrome. If it's deficient mismatch repair, then that could either have occurred sporadically or it could be due to Lynch syndrome. And that depends a little bit on what type of pattern it is and whether or not further testing is needed. So some genes, um, when we see those patterns, we go straight to germline testing. That's MSH2 and MSH6. And then there are other genes where we need to do further testing on the tumour. So if there's absence of MLH1, you need to do either BRAF in colorectal cancer and or methylation um, to see whether it's sporadic or more likely to be Lynch. That's very quick. Does anyone have any questions about the somatic testing before I go on to the next section? Um, I suppose there's one question, Vicky. So um, because Lynch syndrome puts people at risk of other tumours besides gastric, besides coricolorectal and endometrial, is any testing done on, say, gastric tumours or on any of the other tumours? So that's a good question. Um, so Ruth, I think, is on the call, but they have a pilot at Cambridge looking at gastric because very much screening on gastric is important um, and has identified Lynch syndrome carriers. We know that pancreatic, um, basically any Lynch syndrome associated cancer could potentially be screened. And we are looking at extending IHC beyond colorectal and endometrial, particularly thinking about pancreatic because we're, we want to try and diagnose that at, at earlier stages. Um, so we know that if somebody has a mismatch repair pattern that's suggestive of Lynch syndrome, then they should be referred immediately via MDT. We do not want a family history questionnaire at this point, although you can send one if you have one, but we definitely don't want people to wait for that. Um, and there are patient leaflets explaining you might have Lynch syndrome. We don't know, but we can do some more testing to help. OK. Then. Brilliant. And then you can see the, this is just a summary slide showing how that pathway works. But essentially the way that the pathway for diagnosis of Lynch syndrome initially is, you do the IHC on your endometrial or colorectal cancer, you work out if it's deficient. If it's deficient, you do germline testing. So you take a blood sample for the patient, um, and then based on the blood sample, they're able to do germline testing, which looks at the four, it looks at a pattern of the five major genes, so the four proteins we test for, and EPCAM, which is related to MSH2. Then if you have a mutation, then you've identified that person has Lynch syndrome. And at that point, the carrier is referred to both the genetic service to discuss CAST-A testing. So at that point, you'd be able to offer testing to their children, their siblings, parents, cousins, anyone. And we also refer to the Lynch syndrome hub, which is a new service and we have two Lynch syndrome expert hubs in our region. We have one at Cambridge and we have one at in the East Midlands Lynch syndrome expert network. These hubs are supposed to be a repository of expertise and information but also they review carriers to make sure they're getting the right management um, and also difficult cases because there can be some unusual patterns of uh, immunohistochemistry that need to be considered. So these networks now are available to provide the best care and to make sure that people are followed up appropriately. In the East Midlands, we also will be offering, we're not doing it yet, but as of next month, we'll be offering carrier clinics every three months where people can access information about research, the most up-to-date information about management and make sure that they have the sort of care that it sounds as though Leanne had naturally with Julian. Um, and just 
to finish with very briefly, um, if somebody has a relative who's di um, diagnosed through the pathway I've just talked about, they would then come into genetics. So they would come and see myself or Julian or someone like us, and we would discuss their family history, their medical quite history. Quite interesting, this is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we would discuss the advantages and disadvantages of genetic testing um, and the emotional implications. Uh, as well as what screening those people would personally get and at what points in their life we might want to speak to them again. Um, if after all that discussion they decide to go ahead, then they have a blood sample. Depending on the laboratory capacity, they get the results between one to two months later and we discuss the next steps. One of the things that we talk about that Leanne is definitely better placed to discuss than I am is the situation in her family, which is that one sister did have the gene mutation and the other didn't. Um, different families, I'm going to ask Leanne, sorry to, to comment maybe on that, um, because different families have different psychological um, dynamics and that can be very difficult for some families. Um, Leanne, I don't know if you would mind commenting on that. Yeah, no, I mean, at the time, as I mentioned, my sister had a child, so as we were asked to discuss what our best case scenario was and our worst case, and strangely, both have said, well, if I haven't got it and she has, then I'll feel really bad. So and we were offered support bearing that in mind as well. And when it came out that I had it, I think I actually dealt with it better than my sister did at the time. <laughs> when we were sat in the room, but she was offered support around that at the time as well, because it was the guilt factor. But um, yeah, we were supported either way. And there is, a, I know someone's mentioned that in the comments, actually, as well, about how it was with uh, Emma not having it. Um, but again, throughout the whole process, we've just felt supported and we've got that option to to take up on that as well if we wanted to at the time and have further sort of help with that side of things. Thank you. I think that's a really important point. And so in your family, it sounds as though you're very close, which is fantastic and you supported each other. But that's another thing that we discussed because different families are, are different. Um, so that's what we would do in genetic counselling. And that's basically a very whistle stop tour of what Lynch syndrome is and the carriers and uh, management and that sort of thing. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, does anybody have any questions? There is, um, there are a couple in the chat. There's one about waiting time for genetic testing, Vicky. So what is the waiting time for genetic testing in East Midlands for individuals with family history? So at the moment, it's about five to six months before you get an appointment. Um, once you've got an appointment, if you get tested and there's a no mutation, it's about one to two months to get the results. And then there was another question about testing in pregnancy. So if somebody finds that they are a carrier and the sort of the choices that that might give somebody in the pregnancy. So, as I said, this is controversial, um, but it is technically possible, which you could do a CVS or an amniocentesis. So you could take a sample of the placenta or the amniotic fluid, test to see if the baby would be affected. And in theory, you could terminate a pregnancy. Um, I don't remember in my practice ever having taken somebody through that, um, but it is a theoretical option. And it's a lot taken up a lot more in other conditions where the, where the life expectancy can be more impacted. Um, but in theory, it is available. And it, it is quite controversial for adult onset conditions, isn't it? So that sort of whole area it raises quite a lot of ethical um, dilemmas, I guess. So It can do. And certainly in genetics, what we try to do is give people the information and support them to make the best decision for themselves, because we never know them. that we're there to help them make the best decision because everybody's so different. And then Bev had her hand up. I don't know if you've still got a question, Bev. Hi, sorry, um, I was on, uh, just typing away. Um, I've just got one question. I think I know the answer, but if you've got a family with a strong history of Lynch syndrome and we've got a mother who's positive as a carrier, what age is it that she can have her two children tested? So if there's a known genetic mutation, mm -hmm. adults can be tested from 18. So we wouldn't test somebody's children um, at their request. We'd wait till they were adults and they were able to participate in the conversation. Yeah, I thought it was 18. Thank you. 
And then I suppose the final question before we move on to Kirsty from Laura. Can anyone with a strong family history of bowel cancer get tested for Lynch syndrome? Or what criteria are required in order to get tested? And how do you get a referral in Cambridge or anywhere, I guess? If you have a strong family history of cancer and no testing has been done, you can be referred to genetics. Um, the way, best way to do that is just ask your GP to refer you. The genetics department will then have a look at the family history. If possible, they will start doing a test uh, by looking at someone's tumour. If it's not possible, but there's a very strong family history and no one's living, then sometimes it's possible to do an unaffected test. But we definitely prefer to test someone who's had cancer for multiple reasons. And that's always the first step when possible. Ah, oh, thank you very much, Vicky. That's brilliant. And um, I'm sure there'll be of just one. If a 16 year old requests testing, would it be considered? I just saw that popped up just before we hand over to Kirsty. We wouldn't take their blood, but we would see them in clinic. Um, so we would give them the control of their life by meeting with them, speaking with them, explaining all the information and supporting them. But we would not want to actually test them until they were 18 because there's so many reasons why it's better to wait. Um, and if someone's really pushing that, I know at 16, two years feels like a long time, but if someone's really pushing, then it would make me worry about why they're so anxious to know. Right yeah. All right. That's brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Vicky. And so um, Vicky's talked about the pathway for um, people who are affected with a uh, uh, bowel cancer or an endometrial cancer that their cancer should be tested so what we're working towards is speeding up the process where people can find out whether they've got whether they have Lynch syndrome or not so in the past what would have happened so the testing would have been done on the tumor and then the patient would have been referred to clinical genetics and that adds quite a few delays into the pathway and it's really important because some of the as Vicky mentioned it can sort of determine how um, extensive somebody's surgery is somebody who's affected by bowel cancer so what we want to do in the east midlands east of england and all across the country is speed up the pathway and this is where our wonderful clinical nurse specialists come into play and our bowel and, and cancer teams and Kirsty who is a gynae oncology clinical nurse specialist at Nottingham University Hospitals has been involved in mainstreaming genomic testing for endometrial cancer so going to hear from Kirsty now and um, but we thought Kirsty and I thought we might do it as a, a little bit more of a chat is that okay Kirsty? That's fine yeah yeah so just thinking about how do patients get referred to you okay so they can either come in two ways um so they will either come if they've got a known lynch diagnosis already they will come via the genetics team will, will refer them into our service um and they will see our lead clinician who is our lead for the genetics um, within the team and that's Miss Williamson um, and she runs a specific family history clinic so looking at Lynch syndrome and uh, BRCA um, mm -hmm. and she will then go through a comprehensive history with that patient um, and obviously discuss options and onward care or we will see them um, if they're a new patient so they've had um, a, an endometrial biopsy taken and um, as part of that process um, it gets MMR tested so we test every every patient um, and they will come as a new patient to our service um, and we will see them in clinic then. So do you take a family history from patients or does Miss Williamson the... So the clinician seeing the patient will take a family history um, yeah and then obviously um if it deems that we need to test further then we'll take the consent with the patient as a clinical nurse specialist so we will go through that consent with them um, give them an information leaflet for them to take home if they feel at the time that they're not ready to go through that consenting process at that appointment we will either arrange to contact that patient and um, go through it again with them if they've got further questions um, consent them at a different time or mm -hmm. if they ha have had a had surgery and have to have onward treatment so radiotherapy or chemotherapy we have um, 
our counterparts in the medical oncology um, clinical nurse specialist team um, we will we will liaise with them and they will take up that consent at that stage oh that's that's great so just thinking about um, so how do patients find because obviously when they see you they've got a lot of information to take on board they perhaps just have their diagnosis and there's a lot of conversations about next steps for their treatment so how does the genomic testing fit into it i mean how how acceptable do the patients find it um i mean obviously this has all been quite a new process and we're learning every every day as we do this yeah. um, and it is a lot of information because you might well be giving giving the patients their histology results for their cancer right. and telling them that need onward referral for chemotherapy as well as then telling them they could possibly have lynch syndrome and explaining all all that that involves so it is quite a lot for them to take on in one appointment um, but I think that they are really appreciative that we are able to take that consent so I am not a genetic expert in any means and we work really closely with the genetic service here at the hospital and they gave us a bespoke training to be able to um, mm -hmm. take the consent um, and I think they're just very grateful that they can have that done at the same appointment so it relieves another appointment and having to wait for that genetic appointment to even get a consent to take uh, any further testing. Oh I mean that sounds brilliant because obviously it's like a very anxious time for patients and then if it's been introduced oh it might have implications for your family or yeah. you might be at risk of other cancers yeah. they probably want to find that information out as quickly as possible so you're cutting down um, the waiting time for that because I, I know clinical genetics it's like quite a very specialist service and they see patients with all kinds of things and they can have quite long waiting time so that's brilliant so just thinking about the um, results from the genomic testing do you see them or are they seen in clinical genetics for the results are they seen in clinical genetics I think for those results yeah because yeah. because obviously there's quite a lot of um there's quite a lot of complexities around genetic testing yes. and as you yeah um so this so i know vicky said um that the lynch syndrome for lynch syndrome testing it informs the treatment that patients can have for colorectal cancer is that the same for endometrial cancer does it change the treatment? Um, I did speak to Miss Williamson about this and she um, was very passionate and said that she thinks that we're um, on the edge of a revolution were her oh. actual words and um, she said that patients with Lynch syndrome and endometrial cancer often have a better prognosis and don't oh. maybe require so much adjuvant therapy um, but she also said that things were developing rapidly and felt that genetic factors within the tumour will soon influence cancer treatment a bit like with the BRCA and PARP inhibitors um, oh, wow. that we use um, which work by in, uh, the PARP inhibitor works by um, inducing a persistent DNA gap within the tumour cells so she's thinking that something similar will be very soon on the horizon and then will impact the care that the endometrial cancer ladies have that have Lynch syndrome. Oh this is all really exciting stuff it really is and um, it's all about obviously making the pathways better for patients so they have better outcomes and you know cancers get diagnosed earlier when patients have a better chance of making a good recovery. So how do you feel about your role in mainstreaming Kirsty? I mean it's a huge responsibility as I say really? I, am not, I am not a genetic expert and you know to be put in that situation where you can be asked questions that I, I hold my hand up I don't always know the answers but as I say we have a really close link with the genetic team and Miss Williamson is a font of knowledge and is always very willing to come and uh, assist if you get stuck with anything um, but it is really important and it's a, the way things are, are moving forward and you know I feel that it is part of my job now so yeah brilliant yeah now I think you're underselling yourself there that you're doing <laughs> an amazing job so it sounds like if you get if you get stuck because there's always always in clinical practice there's always there's this sort of 
the standard sort of pathways, if you like. But there's always a patient that comes with something unusual or they've got an unusual question. So it sort of sounds like you can go to your consultant colleague mm. or you can contact clinical genetics. Yeah, yeah. And I know that there is now this Lynch MDT, isn't there, that happens. Yeah. So I think if there's anything along, you know, that is really tricky, then that can get discussed as part of that. Oh, that's great. So... I think you said that um, patients and results are seen, um, they're seen in clinical genetics. So do you give patients any information that they can share with their wider family? Yeah, so they all get an information leaflet. Um, yeah. Um, and I, I suppose, you know, when we do the germline testing and we take a consent for that, they get, they, they get an information leaflet that they can take home with them. Oh, and just... Um, thinking about I think you mentioned this before so training and education that because obviously you've said you're not an expert in this you're a clinical nurse specialist so this is a huge new area for you yeah. so what what training and education have you done for your role so we had a bespoke a package that was developed by the genetic team here at the hospital that we under undertook um, which involved some online training as well um, and then that gave us the ability to be able to take consent um, and, and just and just sort of thinking because obviously I think consenting for anything in healthcare practice is fraught with complexities are there a few a sort of anything additional that you'd like to highlight for the genomic testing perspective that uh, you know that sort of made you think oh gosh this is really different from I don't know say consenting somebody for um, hysteroscopy or um, I, I suppose it, it's just making sure that you've explained because the consent is very wordy and, and a lot of patients perhaps don't understand everything that's written and what it implies. So for me personally, when I do take the consent, I, I read out the, what is written and then try and explain it a little bit in more simple language, I guess, um, and just ensure that they fully understand. And obviously, you know, the impact that you also have to take if the patient isn't able to receive those results themselves, who would want oh, those yeah. results to go to? Um, and that can obviously have, ask, you know, it, it implies that there may be something that, that's happening and, and then they obviously have questions regarding that, which when you take a normal consent for surgery, we we don't ask who they want who they want those results going to. So you have a little bit of explaining sometimes to do with, with regards to why we ask that question. Oh yeah, that's yeah. I hadn't thought of that because obviously sometimes people, you know, women's disease can, will be quite advanced and they mm. might not be alive to get the results. So yeah, that's and especially if you've just told the patient that they need to go on and have chemotherapy, and then you're asking mm. who's going to be available if they're not available to receive those results. It, it, it because it's done at the same appointment. Sometimes it can be quite difficult. Oh yeah, so <clears throat> quite emotive then. Yeah. Um, quite um quite challenging for you so thinking just about a little bit about you so it's obviously you've said it's a quite a new role so do you have any clinical supervision or anything or any formal support or is it more informal support say from the clinical genetics team and your consultant and wider colleagues yeah i mean we've obviously as i said we've got the support from the um clinical genetics team and miss williamson and we also have a psychologist that's linked with our team so anything that we've had found difficult he um he has a session with us on a monthly basis that we can oh, discuss wow. any difficulties with oh. regards to any any aspect of patient care so not just lynch syndrome any anything that we have troubles with oh, so we're, very, we're very lucky as a team to have that support Oh, that was fantastic. So we have only got a few minutes left. So I'm just going to ask, has anybody got any questions for Kirsty or Vicky or Leanne before we finish? Because I mean, I think this, I think these presentations have been amazing, but I'm. So let's have a look for anything in the chat. Oh, Thomas. Put your hand up. Yep. Yeah. Uh, this is brilliant. Oh gosh, it's it's mind blowing. <laughs> Thank you very much, all of you. It's really, really excellent. So when um 
you know, when you actually diagnose people, we know obviously, you know, you know, pharmacogenomics and that, you know, medicines work differently on different people. Do you have a range of um, medication or I know that probably um, Kirsty had mentioned that, you know, there is certain uh, medications we're on the brink of new discoveries and stuff like that. But is there just still just we say one set of medication or are there different medications for people's genetic makeup? You mean in, in general? Yeah. Yeah. So pharmacogenomics is a, a rapidly expanding field. Yeah. Um, we're not at the point where we can sequence someone's DNA and tell them um, which uh, medications will be most appropriate or what dosage but that is the future um, yeah. and there are some medications where you can do that um, so for Lynch syndrome we know that immunotherapy with Pembro um, is particularly helpful um, but so sort of is the answer to that uh, the yeah, future yeah, absolutely yeah, but not yeah. quite right not yet mm. thank you so we've got a um, few comments about patient information leaflets so Vicky, Kirsty, and Leanne, where would you say the best sources for patient information leaflets is? Do you think it's Lynch Syndrome UK or do you think there's? I would say that Nottingham has actually got some excellent leaflets. So Claire Searle um, has put a lot of work in and her team has. So when I give patient leaflets, I normally use theirs. Um, so if you just literally look up mainstreaming, if you Google mainstreaming in Nottingham genetics, they've got lots of information about Lynch and actually other conditions on there. Um, OK, and somebody's um, Sarah's asked, um, have you got any leaflets to share? From your side? Well, I can forward Annette the information that we give um, and then I suppose you can distribute it. Perfect. Perfect. So, well, we sorry, I was just oh. going to say as well, one thing I found helpful is on the Facebook group for Lynch Syndrome UK, they hold quite a few leaflets and information sources there as well. It's worth a look if you uh, want to. Oh, and just a final, final question. Skin cancer clinical nurse specialist. Our page, Kimberly, sorry, just calling you skin cancer clinical nurse specialist. It's very, uh, not very friendly. Are patients informed of the risk of developing skin lesions routinely? And is there any advice given about skin surveillance? Typically, we base that on their family history. So if they have no family history or personal history of skin lesions, then we wouldn't refer them to dermatology. Um, any advice that we would give them would be the normal sort of uh, use on screen, wear a hat, avoid sun exposure. Um, if they have a family history, then we might refer them on to dermatology. But that's generally the advice. Oh, so thank you. So I'd like to say a huge thank you to Kirsty, Vicky and Leanne for their amazing talks. It was really, really good. Um, we're going to send out a um, questionnaire to get some feedback. Um, next sort of subjects we've got coming up next month is sort of a bit, little bit more about consent and perhaps some of the practical issues of working in genomics as a nurse. Um, we've also got something on the newborn blood testing program. And I think if there's anything else you'd like, I think it sounds like Tom, you were quite interested in pharmacogenetics. But um, so we'll probably have a break in August and then get going in September. But thank you very much. This has been amazing. And thank you for your questions and participation. So, and Leanne, you're a star. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Bye all. Have a good Thank afternoon. Have a great bank holiday too. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.